Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I take you back to Romans chapter 1 again. We're going to finish off this section next week. But I want to spend some time looking at verses 3 through 5 this morning primarily. And we will get into verses 6 and 7 next week. But <clears throat> just taking our time walking through this. But when we started in Romans, we started all the way back in chapter 12, verse 1. So if you want to turn there with me. We sort of backed into the book a little bit, and the purpose for that is just to sort of get a sense of the direction of where Paul is moving us, and he is leading us into chapter 12. He says in chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And this is where Paul is going to transition into the practical aspect. Before he gets to this, though, there are several things that we need to understand. One, we need to understand the sinfulness of man. If we don't understand the sinfulness of man, then we will know not, not how to, we are to live as believers. The other thing we need to understand is God's salvation, the provision that He has made for mankind and for their salvation, and then the sanctification, if you will, and then the sovereignty of God. And when we understand those things, which Paul sums up in chapter 12, verse 1, the mercies of God, when we understand those things, then we will better know how to live as believers. And so I take you back to chapter 1 and a few verses that we are looking at, but I have titled this series, if you will, Transform to Serve, because essentially that's where Paul is going to lead us. We have all been impacted by the gospel message, the truth of Jesus Christ and all that He has provided. We have embraced that, we've received that, and it has transformed our lives. And therefore, <clears throat> there should be something different about our lives from the rest of the world around us. And if you will, I subtitle this Living as Redefined People of God because essentially that is what Paul is calling us to. Once we understand these truths of the gospel message, once we understand what God has done for us and provided for us, then we know how we are supposed to live. And when we looked at Paul's life, we see this, if you will, this redefined life. So notice with me chapter 1, verse 1 of Romans. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. This is Paul, if you will, defining his life, but not really Paul defining his life, God defining his life. And the reality is for all of us who have accepted the gospel and received Christ as our Lord and Savior, all of our lives have been redefined. It's interesting because there was a period in my life where I was not living the way that I ought to, and I used to say that I was trying to find myself, and that's not the reality of it. The reality of it, I was trying to lose myself. When I became a believer, I was defined by God as to who I was and what I was supposed to do. The issue was is that I was running away from that, and I did not want to be who God wanted me to be. I ran away from the giftedness and the calling He had laid on my life. I did not want to do that, and so therefore I ran away from that. I wasn't trying to find myself. I was trying to lose myself. So many in this world are trying to define who they are. The reality of it is, is that you don't define who you are. Even if you're not even a believer, you don't define who you are. Because the reality is, is that when God molded us and shaped us within the womb, He defined us, did He not? He gave us the giftedness, the talents, the uniqueness of our personalities. And the great thing about Christianity is you, you don't lose the uniqueness of who you are because that's how God created you to be. Even when He gifts us in chapter 4 of Ephesians, He gifted us in a very unique way that no one else has been gifted. So the reality is when you're living the Christian life, you're living under the uniqueness of how God has designed you. But even as a non-believer, God has defined who you are by the uniqueness of your personality, the talents that He has given you. So Paul here, as his life has been redefined by Christ, he defines it and lays it out for us. And I find it very fascinating. The first thing he talks about is the fact that he is a slave of Christ. That really would not be the way that we would define ourselves, but that is how he does for himself. And the great thing is that Paul gives us a model for Christian ministry. <clears throat> he really does. 
He walks through here, he talks about his relationship to Christ, that he is a slave. He talks about his official ministry, he is an apostle. He is a messenger sent to the world. If you will, this term is used oftentimes in reference to missionaries that were sent abroad, but Paul had a unique authority and power and ability. His right and authority was established by the fact that he was called as an apostle. He didn't choose this for himself. In other words, he didn't define himself this way. God did it for him. He was called apostle. He had the authority to speak. And so when he wrote this church in Rome, and they had never seen him face to face, and he wrote this letter to them, he expected that they were going to receive everything that he had written because he wrote with them authority, authority from God himself. When we read this letter, then we understand that Paul had all authority from God to write these truths. And therefore, we must embrace them as Paul has communicated them from God, his master. But there is a limitation to his work. He was confined by the gospel. And I love this statement. Notice the end of verse 1. Set apart for the gospel of God. This is such a defining thing for Paul. And I put this thought up here. He understood this fact that he was set apart for the gospel of God's grace. And he was to proclaim God's good news to all of the world. Notice with me chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. He says, I am under obligation to both Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to foolish. He's embracing all of humanity here by these designations, and we'll talk about them as we get here. But notice verse 15, So for on my part I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. This was his life work. God had defined who he is. God had defined his role within human history. God defined his task and his mission. And so Paul was a man who was set apart for the gospel. The reality is, it is true for all of us. And I love these statements that he makes, because notice with me, as we go through Romans, he talks about the gospel of God, the gospel of his son, the gospel of Christ, and then twice he's going to refer to it as my gospel. Paul's life was so identified with the gospel message that he referred to it as his gospel. His life was given over to the gospel truth. The reality is, for us as believers, that is to be the same for all of us. We are to be living lives that are set apart for the gospel of God. I mean, it is the mandate, right? Matthew 28. It's like my dad shares when he's out golfing with these non-believers, and they said, I think that Don's out here trying to save us. Right? That's his desire. No, it's, he says, it's my mandate to do so. See, that is our role within this world, is to bring the message of God's good news to a lost and dying world. And most of them don't even know it. Most of them don't know that they are under the condemnation of God, and unless they accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, they will suffer eternal damnation. Paul says, this is my gospel, and I understand that I was set apart for it. All Christians are. We're not set apart for our own self-glory. We're not set apart for our own pride. We're not set apart for our own self-service. We're set apart to serve the world. And it is our task to manifest the love of Christ to all of mankind. Is it not? But so often we hold this great message to ourselves when people around us are in agony and pain and they're in misery and depression and everything else they're struggling with and they want to understand life and they want to understand what's going on in this world and when the economy takes a dump and when everything starts going awry they want to understand what's happening and they need to know that there is a sovereign God in control of everything and things don't just happen. And that he is working out a plan and it is coming to its consummation. I give you this quote from Morris. He makes this statement. Obligation to him who died produces obligation to those for whom he died. It's a powerful statement. Obligation to him who died produces obligation for those for whom he died. We all have an obligation to the world. Paul refers to this in verse 14 as a debt. I have a debt to mankind to pay. And it is to take them the good news of God. I mean, if there's anything that we need to know in our life as believers, it's our responsibility to the world, but it's ultimately our responsibility to our, our Master, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are obligated to this world to take them the message of God's good news, that there is salvation, that there is deliverance. Paul talks about the issue of the gospel, and he, this is his exalted subject, if you will, the message of God. And the subject of this message, if you will, is the Son of God, and we'll get into that this morning. But just to highlight for you, the gospel comes from God, the gospel concerns Christ. This is not man's story. Man didn't make this up. Paul's not making these things up. I, I tell you, if you read Romans chapter 1, no human being would write these things about human beings. 
There's no way that man would depict himself in such a way as Paul has depicted man in chapter 1. It's not, it would never happen. I mean, if you look at humanity down through the ages, man thinks too highly of himself to say that he is a reprobate and that he is a sinner and that without God he is lost and condemned. There's no way that man would say that. The reality of it is, is Paul speaks as an apostle authorized by God. He is telling God's diagnosis of humanity. This is the, what God sees in the heart of man, that man is depraved in need of a Savior. And the beautiful thing is that this gospel concerns Christ Jesus, His Son. The content of the gospel, it involves the incarnation. Christ became what we are in order to make us what He is. It's an amazing truth because, you know, so often... People have this wrong conception of what Christianity is. At the heart of it is self-sacrifice. Christ left everything, that the fellowship that He had with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, He came down here, took upon human nature. And I'll just tell you, Christ's suffering didn't start at the cross. And it didn't start when the Roman soldiers beat Him with whips. And it didn't start when they shoved the crown of thorns down upon His head. And it didn't start when He was mocked by His own people. It started at His, if you will, His incarnation, when He took on human nature. That's when his suffering started. That he would leave glory to come down to here. That he would leave there in the fellowship of the Father to come down here with us sinners to bring us the salvation through his blood. This great sacrifice at the heart of Christianity. Christ is not a legendary figure, an imaginary story. He's out of the seat of David. This is his family tree, if you will. God made a covenant back in the Old Testament that from Abraham, kings were going to come. And he made a covenant with David out of that covenant with Abraham that he was going to have one who was going to sit upon the throne forever. Do you realize that there's going to be a consummation which Christ is going to come and reign for a thousand years on earth? And then there's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, but Christ is going to come as king and reign over all? All governments are going to bow before him. It's not an imaginary figure. And I'll just tell you this, that most unbelieving, if you will, historians don't even disagree with the reality of Christ's existence on earth. They reject His deity, but they don't reject His humanity. They can't reject it. It's too evident that He was here. Christ is really truly one with men who came to save man. He gave up so much to come here for us. And at the heart of the gospel is also the resurrection in chapter 1, verse 4. The gospel concerns the world. Why would Christ pay such a high price? Why would He die? So that there could be salvation for all. Paul says, My task is to bring all nations into obedience of the faith. And I love this reality because the scope of man's depravity is answered by the scope of God's saving work. Notice with me in chapter 3, verses 21 to 23. Paul gives this diagnosis in chapters 1 and 2, and he deals with the fact that there is no one, there is no one who is not guilty before God. All stand condemned. But at the same time, God has made provision for all. Notice with me chapter 3, verses 21 and following. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, everyone has sinned. There's no one who is exempt from rejecting God and therefore God's provision is for all those such an amazing truth but yet what we do as believers so often in the church is that we hold back that truth from everybody we compartmentalize right we pick the people that that we would like to see in heaven rather than the people that Christ truly died for that's why I love the gospel of Luke Jesus was there for the outcasts I didn't come for the righteous I came from the, for the sick, for those who needed healing. I love the statements in Luke because Luke is a physician, writes about the life of Christ and all those that he healed. He personally touched each and every one of them and healed them. Even the lepers who no one else would want to do anything or have any association with, Christ was there and he healed them. He wanted to show that he came for the outcasts. And just understand this as Gentiles, we are the outcasts. God's provision is great because man's sin is great in his eyes. The heart of the gospel message, I take you back to chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. The heart of this message is the Son. And we're going to look at the Son this morning and talk about several things about Jesus Christ. If you want to have an understanding as to who He is, <clears throat> these verses lay it out for you. And I'll just tell you this, verses 3 and 4, 
Cranfield in his commentary referred to these as the most notorious passage in all the New Testament. It's not easy. It's not an easy passage. And I may say some things that, that disagree with what some things hold, people hold, but I'll just tell you it's just how we're going to go. And this is the context, and we just deal with it as we roll. But first, the Son and His significance. And this is so crucial because this is how Paul begins. As he talks about the gospel of God, the end of verse 1, which God promised, verse 2, beforehand through His prophets and Holy Scriptures. This was no surprise. This was no new thing. God told this was going to happen. And when we celebrate Christmas and the coming of Christ, it wasn't just a chance happening. And this wasn't something that happened spur of the moment. Jesus, God said that Jesus was going to come. It was going to happen. And it happened. Amazing. It happened. God was good to His Word. He promised it and it was fulfilled. And notice this, though, this, this gospel message, verse 3, concerning His Son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. The first thing about this is the prepositional phrase starts verse 3, concerning his son. And it looks back to the end of verse 1, the gospel of God. And really what it does is defines it and it gives it, if you will, an attribute. But this is a gospel that is all about the son. And this is such a powerful truth because when Paul uses this term, he uses this term huyas 12 times in reference to Christ and also to believers, which I find is fascinating that John in his gospel, he likes using techna. He doesn't like using weos because he holds it in high regard because weos is used in reference to Jesus Christ as the Son of God. But Paul will use it in regards to believers because he wants to under, uh, us to understand the great condescension, if you will, on God's part that he stooped down. He made us a part of his family. But here he uses it in reference to Christ and he is the only one recorded in Acts who ever preached that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Just think about that for a moment. Paul was the only one to ever preach this and this was after his conversion. Acts chapter 9 verse 20. We have this recorded by Luke. For now several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus to the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. This is a huge thing, because Paul was a Jew, monotheistic, right, in his belief. And now he's out declaring that there is a trinity, if you will. This was not something that, that you would do as a Jew, not someone who was a hard and fast Jew in Judaism, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I mean, sometimes we read over these passages and we think, so what? But see, we're reading it from our perspective, right? And all the theology that we know and the doctrine and so on. And we read it and think, well, so what? Of course he would preach that. No, this was a huge thing for Paul. His life was redefined on the road to Damascus. And so was his message. And so was his understanding of who God was. This is powerful. I mean, if you want to talk about the transforming power of the gospel, Paul, read Acts chapters 8 and 9. Paul was enemy number one of the church. He despised the proclaimed Messiah. He didn't believe that he was the Messiah. And he, he despised all who would ascribe to the Messiah and say that he was the coming one that was promised in the Old Testament. He tried to destroy the way. And in Acts it says that he was like a ravenous animal ripping at the flesh of a corpse. He was trying to destroy the church. And now, all of a sudden, he is the greatest missionary we know of in Scripture. That's a redefined and transformed life by the gospel. You can't ever question the power of this truth when you look at the lives that it changes. I mean, seriously, if we were sat down and shared our testimonies and the truth of what God has done in each of our lives, and this is the time of the year where I sit back and reflect on all those that we fellowship with and walk in the Lord with and to watch in all of our lives just over this last year how God has changed us. This is not some self-discovery or self-awareness. It's a getting off of ourselves and God changing our life. Paul in chapter 8 to 13 of Acts, he says this, And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers that God has fulfilled this promise to our children and that He raised up Jesus as it was written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. This was such a huge thing for Paul. And when he talks about Christ being the son of God, it's a very intimate expression. I mean, just think about that son in relation to the father. It was very personal, it was ethical, and it was inherent. Sometimes we don't get this, but when he talks about the fact that he is the son of the father, that he is the son of God, that he is declaring equality, he shares the very nature of God the Father. 
You read in, in John in his gospel, right? The Jewish leaders, they were upset when Jesus said, referred to God as his father. Why? Because he was declaring equality with God, that he possessed the same nature as God. It's like I am my father's son. I, I look like him a little bit. I may share some of his characteristics, but I also share some of his nature. My boys are sons of their father. They share some of my nature. The reality is, is that the son shares nature with the father. There is a community that exists there. You know what's amazing about this fact, though, is how Paul refers to the son of God. It's such an intimate expression. He is the son of the father, God the father. But he also uses this description when he talks about God's care for humanity and God's care for people. Just just understand this. Read some of these passages with me. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Do you understand that God took the first step in salvation? We were enemies of God. <laughs> and people are still enemies of God. They refuse to acknowledge His existence. Read Romans chapter 1. They suppress the truth in ungodliness and unrighteousness when God has made it clear and evident to them that He exists. The reality is, Romans 1, you cannot look at creation and not acknowledge that God is there. But we suppress this. But do you realize that God took the initiative to reconcile us to Himself? I mean, we're the ones who sever the relationship, starting with Adam all the way down. We're the ones who reject Him. We're the ones who deny Him. And He's the one who reaches out to us and provides that reconciliation. And how did He do it? He did it through His Son, the death of His Son. Paul goes on to say, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I want to show you something. Romans chapter 1, look with me. Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God has made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Sin is such a personal thing against God. I mean, just realize this. They don't glorify Him or even give thanks. I mean, we partake of the creation of God, do we not? We eat His abundant produce, do we not? And we eat our vegetables and all of these things that God provides and all of the things within this unique system that He has created. He provides these things and we partake of them. And He says, you don't even thank Him for that. You don't honor Him as God and you don't even give thanks to that. And you realize it is such a personal thing against God. It's an attack against Him that He is the provider and yet we don't even say thank you. This is why for me it is such an important thing when I sit down at the table, I pray and I tell the kids, we do not eat until we thank God first because He has made the provision. Such a personal attack against Him, but do you realize the personal sacrifice He made to bring us into a right relationship with Him? He sent His Son to die. And it was only through the death of His Son that we could be reconciled. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, For those for whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. 8.32 says this, He who died... He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? All this is done by the Father through the Son to us. A personal attack against God, and yet God makes such a personal and intimate provision for us by sending his Son. He is the great mediator between us all. The names of the Son, notice with me chapter 1. This comes at the end of verse 4. If you look with me, chapter 1, verse 4. Who has declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I start with the end of verse 4, and we'll move backwards and look at 3 and 4 in a little bit. But I wanted to come to verse 4 because he starts off with declaring that he is the Son of God, verse 3. And then he gives this summation statement, Jesus Christ our Lord, at the end of verse 4. And it's interesting because we're going to look at each one of these designations quickly, but there's significance in the order in which they are given. Jesus Christ and then Lord. But first he starts off in verse 3, He is the Son of God. 
Now I want to show you something because this is a crucial and important thing to understand in regards to the Son. And this starts us going, if you will, because when he mentions the Son in verse 3, there are going to be two phrases in here. They're relative, if you will, clauses that are, are given for us, but actually they're participles in the Greek text in the original. But its statement is, who was born a descendant of David, and then verse 4, who was declared the Son of God with power. Both of these flow out of the statement of that he is his son in verse 3. So that starts the ball rolling, the declaration that he is his son, and then everything unfolds from that. But I want you to understand this, that Paul makes a statement in verse 3 about his sonship before he even talks about his incarnation. Okay, This is important because he was always the son of God. Now notice with me in verse 4, because he says in verse 4, who was declared the Son of God with power. But understand, Paul wants us to make clear for us that he was always the Son of God. He didn't become the Son of God at the resurrection. He was declared to be the Son of God at the resurrection, but he didn't become the Son of God. There wasn't a changing in essence. There was a changing in status. He was made known to all that he was Son of God when he was resurrected from the dead. But Paul starts off with declaring, first of all, that he is the Son before he declares his incarnation. What does that tell us? We talk sometimes, people talk about the origin of Jesus Christ. There is no origin of Jesus Christ. He existed eternally before he was incarnate, before he took on human nature. He was always Son of God, then he took on human nature, he took on flesh. So when we talk about Christ, there is no origin, only incarnation. He is the eternal Son of God. And it's powerful for us to understand this because when Paul moves in this next section, and I'll just tell you, King James Version, if you have King Jimmy, you'll notice that in King Jimmy, they actually take the last line of verse 4, Jesus Christ the Lord, and they move it up into verse 3 and put it after concerning His Son because they're so concerned that people read about His descent from David and His according to the flesh that somehow they're going to miss His deity. So they take that part from the Greek text and they move it up into verse 3 so that we understand His deity. Don't do that because what we do is we miss the climax. And really this designation that comes here is a climax. So he talks about the Son, and then he gives these, if you will, these participial statements, who is born, who is declared Son of God, and everything flows out of this, and it's very symmetrical. And we'll look at this in a moment, because this is what he's going to do. He's going to establish for us something unique about the Son and all of the names. But we understand, first and foremost, one, because he can talk about him as Son in relation to the Father, the Son is distinct. He has his own personality, and yet at the same time, there is community of nature. He is the same nature as the Father. So I teach my children about the doctrine of the triunity of God. He is one in essence, but three in person. And that doctrine is upheld here. Now don't be thrown. Jehovah's Witnesses come to the door and say, Do you know that Trinity is not in the Bible? Absolutely it is not. The Word isn't. The doctrine is. Right? And even Trinity is not a, it's not a valid term really to, to use in regards to this doctrine because it is the tri-unity. Trinity only focuses on the trinal aspect, not the unification or the one in essence. But the doctrine is there, so do not be fooled. The first name he gives in this designation in verse 4 is Jesus. And this, if you will, follows an apposition to verse 3. So all of this is defining His Son, and it looks back to the statement of the Son in verse 3. So the Son is Jesus Christ our Lord. And this reveals the content of the Gospel, really, and it's climactic, because what He is revealing in these two verses is the deity and humanity of Christ. And all of this is summated in this statement of these names, and really it comes as a climax of what He's been talking about in verses 3 and 4. And so, if you will, contextually, this is how He sets it up. All of this flows, starting with concerning His Son, and it flows down to this last statement. I'll translate it for you. Namely, Jesus Christ, the Lord of us. This is the climax of it all. So when we start messing with the original text and moving things around, we miss the point of what Paul is doing for us, and he is leading us to this statement. And when he gives these designations in regards to Jesus Christ, he wants us to understand that these are very significant. Not just the terms themselves, but the order in which they come. And then we realize the eternal nature of the Son, but also the fact that He took on flesh. The Son of God from all eternity, He took on human nature, and He came down here, and John says, He tabernacled among us. In, Rome, in Galatians, we saw in chapter 4 that in the fullness of times, He did this. He humbled Himself. It was necessary for this to happen, 
for salvation to be brought because Jesus had to come and he had to bear the name of Savior. That's what his name means, Jesus. I give you this passage from Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, weak as it is through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. He is the great go-between. There needed to be a mediator between ourselves and God, and someone had to pay the price. Someone had to bridge that gap. And Jesus Christ was the one to do that. He's the only one who could do that. He came to fulfill all that the law demanded. He came to pay the price. Notice with me, chapter 5, verses 18 19. So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. Just as sin was brought into the world by Adam, by Christ, righteousness was brought into the world. For as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. There had to be the mediator. There had to be the go-between. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he talks about the fact that there is one God, one God and one mediator, which is really crazy. One God. Just think about that. One God. If there's only one God, there's only one way to God. You see, how many times do you hear people say, well, there's a thousand roads to God. There's not a thousand roads to God. It's one God. There's not a thousand gods. There's just one. If there's only one God, then there's only one way to God, and that is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man comes to the Father but by me. You can't reason to Him as great as the Greek philosophers were, that there's no way that they even reason and think their way to God. The only way to God is through Jesus Christ. And Jesus has provided that way for us by taking on flesh and coming down here and subjecting Himself to this realm so that we could have communion with God. So if you will, Jesus, this name, we, we just, sometimes we use the names, we don't even think about the significance of this, but do you realize this was his personal name, but it reflected his mission, it reflected his character, it reflected what he was here for in regards to the world. He is its Savior. He is its Savior. But you can't stop there. And I would just tell you, most, most apostles, they would not use just the name of Jesus. They would use other designations with it. Paul would like to do this oftentimes, and it's interesting that Paul likes the order Christ Jesus. Why? Because he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus as the risen Messiah. All the other disciples liked the order Jesus Christ because they encountered him first in his humanity, and then they came to understand his deity. But Paul wants it in distinct order here so that we understand the progression. Christ here, this is the equivalent of the Hebrew Messiah. He is the anointed one, the fulfiller of all prophecies in the Old Testament. And he walked this earth for 30 years, and then the Spirit of God came upon him, according to Isaiah, and he anointed him to fulfill the role of the Messiah. Not only that, but he is also the Lord. The Son of God from all eternity, he became man. He also took on his messianic role as anointed by the Holy Spirit as baptism. He is also now declared the Lord of all. And there will come a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every government, every human being, everyone will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the consummation of it all. But I love this statement because Paul says he is the Lord of us. He is the Lord of us. I mean, this is a title that Paul loves. 230 times he uses this in reference to Christ. He is my Lord. He is our Lord. You see, so often we like to call upon Jesus my Savior, but do you realize that when we call upon Him as Savior, we also call upon Him as Lord and Master of our life. There really shouldn't be need for writing any books about the Lordship, salvation, or any of that. The reality is, is that as soon as we confess Him as Jesus, our Savior, He is also Lord and Master of our life. Why? Because He's the one who bought us. In the doctrine of atonement, He is the one who paid the price. He is the one who purchased us from the slave market of sin and Satan and our selfish, sinful nature. He is the one who has paid the price, set us free. He has now purchased us and He owns us. And we think, man, how stifling is that to be a slave, right? We go from slavery to slavery. No. Uh-uh. Jesus says, no, my yoke is easy. My yoke is easy. It's the greatest thing. I'm learning this every day of my life as I go on in life. It's great to be the slave of Christ. 
I could not even imagine this life. And my greatest of dreams would not even imagine this life. I'm celebrating my anniversary today with my wife. Could not imagine the life that my master had designed for me. I wouldn't have imagined six children, the last two being twin boys that are running all the energy out of me. I would have never imagined this life. The people that I've encountered in this life, those who have so enriched me by God bringing them into my life, there's no way that I could have ever have dreamed this, but my master designed this. You see, it stinks to be enslaved to sin. It stinks to be enslaved to our sinful nature. We can't get off ourselves and serve other people. It's so great to be liberated in Christ because we can serve others and we don't have to care about our rights. We can let them go. There is something so freeing about that. We stop worrying about what do we get and what do we not get and whether we're not getting the things that we think we deserved and so on and just saying, you know what, I'm just here to serve you. There's liberation in that. And only Christ provides that. This term, Lord, is translation of the Hebrew Adonai, which was replaced the Tetragrammic time, which is what we refer to as the, if you will, the four consonants. This was the covenant name of God, Yahweh. We find it in the English translations in the Old Testament. Yahweh is translated all capital letters, L-O-R-D. Adonai is translated capital L, lowercase O-R-D. And so what happened was because the Jews, they, they, this was the covenant name of God. You just didn't speak it. And so what they did was and then when they would read the Hebrew text, they would never pronounce the name of God, Yahweh. They would always say Adonai in place. So when they added vowel pointings, the Masoretes did, they took the vowel pointings from Adonai and put them on Yahweh so that they would remind those who were reading publicly, you do not say this name, you say Adonai. And this name, Lord, is from that. But it reflects the fact that He is master over all things. Several things that this designation affirms. First is cosmic majesty. When you look at the resurrection of Christ, we realize that it's not some resuscitation of a corpse in which he died again. Not like Lazarus. Lazarus was brought up from the grave, but he died again. Jesus didn't die again. God exalted him to his right hand. He sits supreme over all things. In the consummation of all things, he will be Lord over all again. But notice this in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, Peter says this in his sermon on the day of Pentecost, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He now sits supreme at the right hand of the Father, and all things are subject to him. Not only that, but it reflects his clear status as master. This is the opposite of Paul's statement of being the slave of Christ. He is my master. And not only that, but he adds on this personal pronoun, our, our, he is our Lord. This is a confessional statement. In other words, he owns us. We belong to him. We are his property. How many times do we think of that as believers? How many times do we think of that when we're making plans in our life? Right? Designing the things that we want for life and what we want to do and how we want to do them. Are we asking the master first? Are we sure that we're seeking His way rather than our own way? But this isn't just merely an acknowledgement of the fact that He possesses us. This is an acknowledgement of commitment and of allegiance. You see, Paul served one will, one will only. He was committed to Christ, and that was it to the very end. You read in 2 Timothy, he knows he's going to die, right? His whole life was given for the gospel, and he was going to die living for the gospel. That's it. Talk about a redefined life. It also reflects the trust and commitment. I mean, do we really believe that He is sovereign over all things? Can He not then handle the things in our life that we face, whatever the needs may be? It's a great because, you know, at Christmas we stop as a family and we just reflect on what God has done over the year. It's amazing the ways that He has provided for us. Amazing. Still just astounds me. It astounds me not that He does, it's just the way that He does it. I mean, you never expect the things to come the way that they come. But God has so abundantly provided over the last year, and I, I, there's no way I would ever have pictured it coming the way that it did, but God is so amazing to us as, if you will, our Lord over our life. But His humanity, if you will, verse 3. He is fully man, verse 3. According concerning His Son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. 
he is going to reflect on the fact that he's preeminent not only in his humanity but also in his deity. And we have these two parallel statements, and these are parallel statements, and we can't miss this. But he talks about according to the flesh, and then in verse 4, according to the Spirit. And so some translate this in verse 4, according to the Spirit, capital S, referring to the Holy Spirit. And I would suggest to you that it's not the Holy Spirit, it's His Spirit. So really what we're talking about here is we're talking about His person, but in the sphere of relationships. In other words, He is one person, but He belongs to two realms. The human realm and the spiritual realm are the, if you will, in regards to his humanity, in regards to his deity. And that's what we have paralleled here. So born of the seed of David. This is an interesting term because the typical term for being born of genao, but he doesn't use it, is genomai. Genomai means to become, come to pass, come into being, happen. We have this used in two different places, Galatians 4.4, and I'll translate it accordingly for you. And when the fullness of time did come, God sent forth His Son, come into existence of a woman, come into existence under law. In other words, He comes from one condition to another condition, or from one existence to another. John 1.14 says this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. In John chapter 1, verse 1, He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in 1.14, And the Word became flesh. He came from one condition to another condition, or one existence to another existence. And this is the term that He uses here. And it's unique because although he talks about his humanity, he's going to lead us towards his deity. And the great thing is, is that he is out of the seed of David, spermatos, out of the seed of David, germinated from his line. This is a great truth because God never forgets the covenants that he made. Whatever promises God makes, he keeps. That's why I tell my wife and kids, you know what? I, I'm very careful to make promises to my family. They know that, and, and, I, and I really strive to be good on my promises, so I'm very cautious in saying, I promise. You realize that when God says, I promise, He always fulfills that, always. He's never failed, never failed. Even after thousands of years, He still never fails. So the great thing is what He tells us is going to happen in the future in Revelation, He's not going to fail. It's going to happen exactly how He says it's going to happen. But here we have the issue of the fact that there is a king. And we know the world needs a king, but it needs the king. And the king is going to come, and he's going to reign. Our prayer is that he starts to reign in the lives of those now, yes, but we know that his kingdom is going to come. But according to the flesh, why does he add this? There's really no reason to add according to the flesh. If he says according to the seed of David, the descendant of David, then we already understand his humanity. Why according to the flesh? The reality is, is that he's going to lead us to something greater than this. He's going to reflect on his deity, not just his humanity. And so he adds on this statement. But he is, if you will, fully man, fully humanity. So we say that he is the God man, if you will. He is fully God and fully man. And we don't understand two natures of one person, but that's the reality of it. And Paul doesn't get into all the details. He just says it's true. And in verse 4, he moves towards his deity. So we see this as in regards to his humanity. He became, if you will, but in his deity, he was declared. Verse 4, notice with me, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So as humanity he became, but as deity he is declared. There's no change in his essence. He was always Son of God, even before his incarnation. The sphere of this declaration of Christ's sonship was in power. I mean, the amazing thing is that when he was raised from the dead, there was power. I mean, this is why the religious leaders, man, they wanted to put a squelch on them what was going to happen. He rose from the grave and the guards, the soldiers come and say, he's gone. And well, we got to make up this lie, right? Read Matthew chapter 20. Got to make up this lie and tell them that the, the disciples stole his body or something. Happened, and you guys, we'll pay you. You just go and tell everybody this and we'll cover you with the, with the leaders. But you got to say that he, his body was stolen because if, if people find out that he, has, he rose from the dead or he's gone, Imagine what's going to happen. They were so frustrated, the religious leaders, by the attention that Jesus got and the fact that he had so many disciples coming to him because people wanted to hear and to see because he was manifesting the power of God. When he rose from the dead, it really revealed, truly revealed his very nature that he is Son of God. It was done in power. The measure of the declaration of Christ's sonship was according to the spirit of holiness. I give you this thought, the sonship which is declared by the resurrection was in accord with the spirit of holiness, which was the inmost and deepest reality of his person and life of Christ. It's interesting because this statement here, it's, it's never used in regards to the Holy Spirit, the particular term that is used here. 
Hagiosunes, it's not used in reference to the Holy Spirit. Hagion is, but not this term. This is talking about his own spirit, if you will. It is that spirit which is characterized by holiness. I love this because, you know, we heard the statement, can't keep a good man down. You cannot keep a holy man down. Because this was his nature, there's no way that he could succumb to death and to remain dead. There's no way. You can't keep this one down. As human as he was, he was deity. And therefore, the grave was not going to hold him, could not hold him. This is the great comfort for all of us, right? Because I know where I'm going when I die. I know that there's the great resurrection. I possess resurrection life right here, right now. That's why it's so crazy to me why we as believers don't take more chances with our lives. Why aren't there more Jim Elliots who are willing to go out there to headhunters to take the gospel and willing to sacrifice their life for the sake of telling someone good news who's never heard it before? Why aren't we willing to take those risks when we possess the resurrection life now? We know that the grave will not hold us down. Oh, death, where is thy sting? It's no longer there. Because Christ has abolished death. It has no mastery over us anymore. I don't have to be afraid to die. What's crazy to me is believers, we're so conscientious about trying to save our life. I want to live longer. I don't want to live longer. I don't want to stay here. I'm like Paul. I don't want to stay here. It's miserable here. I want to be with Christ. And if he's not here, I don't want to be here. We're so busy trying to hang on to the flesh. It's interesting because I was asked to preach in this passage through Matthew, right? If the eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. If the arm causes you to cut it off, right? At the time, my mom was going through cancer. It was potential that they would have to remove parts of her because of this cancer. And I thought, you know, we would do this to save our life. We would remove body parts to live longer. Would we do that for sin in our life? I believe it's Origen who castrated himself in light of that passage, but we would be willing to do that. I mean, we're so concerned about our physical being. What about the spiritual being? We possess the resurrection life. Man, what's holding us down? Extreme games should have nothing on us as believers. Why don't we push the limits for eternity rather than for humanity? The means of declaration of Christ's sonship was by the resurrection out from the dead ones. This is the guarantee for all of us. Paul says in Colossians, he is the firstborn out from among the dead. <laughs> he was never subject to death again. Never. The disciples saw him ascend into heaven. There's something to be said for our senses, right? Seeing, tasting, touching, smelling, right? John built off of these. We saw him. We beheld him. They watched him ascend. They know that he's going to return in the same way. This is our guarantee. The Son's authority, notice with me, verses 5 and 6, primarily verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for His name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. The channel of Paul's ministry is Christ, and we're going to go back and look at this next week, but just realize that the heart of all of this, it's concerning the Son, and because Paul has this great message of God's good news, the gospel that concerns the Son of Jesus Christ and all that He is. He is Jesus. He is Christ. He is Lord. He has made the great provision. He is also the one who has sent me out to the world to tell them about Him. Paul lays out for us the purpose of ministry. It is unto obedience. The scope of the ministry, it's to all the Gentiles. It's to all the nations, if you will. And the motivation for this ministry, it is for His name's sake. It's for His glory. We'll come back and talk about this next week. But do you realize we have just the most amazing message to offer the world? People are looking for hope. They're looking for answers. The reality is, is we have it right here in front of us, and yet we withhold it. We don't share it with others. And this isn't just about leading up to conversion. The gospel is about every day, all day for all of us, right? I mean, that's the great thing. Paul's writing to the church of Rome, and I want to come and preach the gospel to people who have already received the gospel. Why? Because it's not something just to conversion. It's about all of life. You need to understand these truths so that you live that transformed life, that life that is redefined. So therefore, we need to understand these things. But our life has been transformed, do you understand this, to serve. There's nothing self-centered about salvation and sanctification. What God has offered us isn't just for us. It's for others. 
The great truths of chapters 12 and following is get off yourself and get on other people. We have been redefined by the gospel of God. We are the people of God, and therefore we need to take this message to the world. Everyone's looking, but we have the answer. May God help us as we seek to live as redefined people of God. Let's pray.